Having just recently turned 51, didn't do that on my actual birthday. Anyway, I'm gonna bring you up to speed on my skincare routine and explain why I'm less focused on biohacking in favor of prioritizing four key pillars of aging well. And I'm gonna tell you right now that the path to following these four pillars is not always smooth. My hormones are doing their best to throw me off at the moment. And last night, I must have got a total of about three hours sleep. So here I am sitting talking about skin and health and probably looking a bit ragged around the edges. But anyway, if you watched my video a year ago summarizing my routine at 50, you'll see I've made a few key adjustments, so stay tuned for that. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to learn how to age well, look and feel good for longer, and share what I learn with you. And I do that by keeping up with the latest research, monitoring what the leading scientists and physicians are saying, and by interviewing skincare pioneers, doctors, scientists, nutritionists, and other experts. That happens right here on the Honest channel and on my website, honest.scot, so be sure to check it out. But now, let me talk you through some of the bigger changes I've made in the last year and what I prioritize to age well. So let's start with skincare. And to anyone new to the channel, the name of the game for me with skincare is to focus on natural skin hydration and health because I think that's the best route to your skin looking plumper, smoother and even toned for longer without major clinical intervention. And the biggest change I've made in the last year is I've stopped washing my face with anything that even resembles soap. So I'm doing that as part of a wider routine that's designed to encourage natural oil production of my skin and to support its microbiome. And I'll link to an article that I've written about that below and in the description where it says show more. And I'll also include a link to a page which describes my full skincare routine and shares the individual products I use and I'll be talking a little bit about. Now, obviously too much oil can play havoc with our skin when we're younger, but as we age, our skin can naturally become drier. So we wanna help it along as much as we can. And for me, that means at night, I cleanse with a gentle, unfragranced and natural oil-based balm from a skincare startup called Harborist. And I use it to break down my makeup, then I rinse and I use a cloth uh, to make sure that all my makeup is removed. Around two nights a week, I still use a retinoid. For years on and off, I've used retinaldehyde, also known as retinal, which I find gentle and the least drying of the retinoids that I've tried, but still effective. So that's my go-to. My mainstay is Geek & Gorgeous. It's an uncomplicated, unfragranced formula and fairly priced too. But I do alternate just so I can try out new things and I'm happy using a retinal based formula from Niche Beauty at the moment called A Retinoe, which is also reasonably priced around uh, £35, which converts to about $40 to $45. It's really nicely formulated, suitable for sensitive skin like mine, and includes uh, retinal retinoate and a third key ingredient, which is sodium retinol hyaluronate. And that's the extract of low molecular weight hyaluronic acid and retinoic acid. So it's designed basically to hydrate as well as doing the job of a retinoid, which is to speed up the turnover of skin cells. And I continue to use retinoids because of their action on fine lines and for keeping skin clear and even toned. But I do use them sparingly because of their drying effect on skin or certainly on my skin. And I still cycle with Callisum's multi-action cream, so using it for a few months at a time as my nighttime moisturizer. And I feel it's been really good for balancing my skin and for improving its health in terms of plumper, calmer, hydrated skin. It contains growth factors and that's why I cycle it because some doctors have expressed safety concerns around their use in skincare. And so I'm just being cautious basically. And um, I'll link to a previous video in the description that I've done on Callisum including on my dad's really visible hair regrowth using their serum. And it will give you all the background on safety too. Lastly at night, I apply this Renew Pure Radiance Oil from True Botanicals. I only use a few drops because it's pricey at $110 for a 30 milliliter bottle and a little goes a long way. So I make it last several months. It's non-comedogenic, so it doesn't block pores 
and it's packed full of natural plant-based omega fatty acids and antioxidants. And so I find if I apply this at night, I wake up with a nice shiny oily face in the morning and that's my own face oil. And that's what I think helps keep my skin in reasonable condition. And then instead of a skin patch, I use castor oil, that big trending ingredient of the moment. Yes, I succumb to it too, but I use it as a natural occlusive on drier areas around my eyes to kind of seal in the moisturizer. And Vaseline would do a similar job if you find castor oil irritating. In the mornings, I just rinse my skin in the shower and then here's what I think the key test of skin health is. So by only rinsing my skin in the mornings and not washing or cleansing, and having done that for a couple of months now, I find when I get out of the shower, my skin doesn't feel tight at all when it dries. Whereas before, my skin always felt tight after I got out of the shower and I just couldn't wait to moisturize. You might wanna consider potentially cutting back on actives as I've done to give your skin a bit more slack to self-hydrate and self-nourish. I am testing out a new serum at the moment, something I purchased after stumbling across it online, and it involves an ingredient sourced from space. But that's all I'm saying for now because I'm gonna be bringing you more on this very soon and letting you know if I think it's out of this world or not. But beyond that, in the mornings, I just apply a fermented oil from Maysama, which is hyper gentle, unfragranced again, packed with omega fatty acids and antioxidants. But the fact that the oil is fermented means it's really readily absorbed into the skin. And so it hydrates, but you can still apply makeup over it without the makeup running. And it's reasonably priced at $53 or £44 for 30 milliliters. So it's half the price of the True Botanicals oil. And you could use this at night too. And for a sunscreen, I mainly use Blue Lean Sun Fix Moisturizer. I've used that for over a year now. It's pricey for me because I have to pay shipping to the UK from the US. It's uh, £47 to buy, $58 for 98 milliliters. And it contains the physical sunscreen zinc oxide and the anti-aging ingredient methylene blue, which has been found to slow cell aging and protect the skin from sun damage. Now the official SPF is 21, but that's because methylene blue is not recognized yet as a sunscreen by the FDA. So I'll link to an interview with the scientists behind it if you want to find out more. But I love this because it sits really nicely on my skin, provides a bit of added moisture, it's not irritating, and I think it does a good job with sun protection. I'm also pretty keen on one skin's SPF. And when I'm not using Calisum, then I like to sneak this one in because one skin's moisturizer, it's my mum's absolute favorite. It contains their own propriety peptide, which has some impressive research attached to it. Again, I've interviewed the scientists behind it, so I'll link to that below as well. But their SPF is an opportunity for me to include their ingredient in my routine from time to time. And it's a lovely, lightweight, non-greasy sunscreen, again with zinc oxide, but it also includes the propriety peptide and similarly to Blue Lean, that provides additional protection. Officially, it's an SPF 30, though they call it 30 plus. It's priced at $56 or £45, but again, if you're outside the US, watch because there are shipping costs. You can get it in a tinted or untinted formula, but there's not a whole lot of it at 40 milliliters. So this isn't one I could justify using every day, and the Blue Lean is really my main one. And that's pretty much it for skincare. Fairly simple, really, and a mix between averagely priced products with a couple of more expensive ones I would call hero products. I'm doing something a little different on my neck at the moment and I'll film a separate video because I've been trialing the new face and neck remodel mask from Blue Lean, which is an interesting one. And in terms of devices, I'm still using the Zip Halo microcurrent device to help with muscle toning in my face and to boost blood flow to the skin and therefore the skin cells. I use it every other night, alternating with the Nera Pro Laser, which I use on my brow area, the edges of my upper eyelids, around the jaw and sides of my mouth. And I started using it on my face just a few weeks ago after my recent interview with Nera founder David Bean, which again, I'll link to below. And to be fair, I grilled him with audience questions for an hour and by the end of it I felt I fully understand how it works because it's simply targeting water 
and only water in the surface layers of our skin to stimulate collagen production, reaching less than a millimeter. So it's not going deep at all. And I use it every other day because David Bean told me that their own study showed people who only used the near of 50% of the recommended daily frequency still got results. A little known fact there. So I find it a bit too drying to use daily, so every other day works for me. And I also want to build in breaks, so I'm not just using that over and over again. Results are supposed to continue for up to three months after use, so this is one that I will likely cycle if I see good results from using it at the moment. And you'll see that throughout my routine, I'm limiting frequency of use with stronger actives and technology to get the benefits, or try to, while minimizing any downsides and allowing my skin to recover and do its own thing. Red light is still a big deal for me. I use a panel from Mesama so I can cover my face, neck and decolletage all in one go. And it also has a pulse light option which gives you all the benefits but make sure you don't overdo it with prolonged exposure. And I use it for around six minutes four mornings a week and I sit doing my facial exercises while I'm at it. So if my panel is on constant light mode I'm generally moving position while I do my exercises and then I put it on pulse for a couple of minutes covering my goggles with my hands actually because I find the flickering really full on even with the goggles and that is a definite downside of pulse light. Most experts though would say if you have a red light mask at home it's fine to use it for up to 10 minutes without worrying too much about overexposure. Unfortunately as with so many things in skincare we don't know for sure what too much looks like so let your own skin guide you. In terms of clinical procedures, I don't really do too much at the moment. I usually have um, Botox between my brows roughly every nine, 10 months. So it has worn off at the moment. And um, I've booked in to do a course of three more microneedling facials using the Callisum Exosome Serum, which I reviewed on the channel a couple of months back. And I get that done at a local aesthetic clinic. Moving on now to lifestyle. And here's why I don't count myself as a biohacker. First, I'm not strict enough to be honest. And secondly, because I don't believe we have quite the amount of knowledge at this point in time to outsmart the human body by taking lifestyles and things like supplementation to extremes. And more importantly, because I'm on this earth to enjoy myself too. That said, biohackers are helping to move the dial and push the frontiers of human health. So it's always good to keep an eye on what they're up to and what approaches stack up longer term. For now, what I think is really clear through larger scale research studies is that there are four very simple, uncontroversial pillars of healthy aging. And in my view, these are the ones to stick to. So what are they? Well, number one is to eat natural. This, in my opinion, is the thing that could change our national health woes in mere months if more was put into food education by governments. I mean, forget biohacking because in the US and UK, our life expectancy is actually decreasing. And I'm a bit concerned that all the argument on social media about what you should and shouldn't eat just confuses people so they don't know where to begin in the first place. And I know that I have certainly felt like that. But if you can just cut out or cut down on processed snacks, drinks and meals and eat and drink food in their natural form, that's an amazing starting point. Some of us have allergies and conditions that prevent us eating specific ingredients. Some of us don't want to eat meat. That's fine because if you're eating natural whole foods, it's the very best basis to then fine tune around that. Processed foods don't just contribute to weight gain because they create cravings and don't keep you feeling satiated for long. So they stack up against your health in general. They're nutrient poor, often low in fiber and higher in unhelpful fats and preservatives and loaded with sugar or sweeteners and salt. And they can negatively affect the microbiome of your gut, which requires fiber and nutrients to flourish. A healthy gut affects every aspect of your being. It's impossible to overstate its importance. So for me, Eating whole foods is a really big thing to do to give myself a good chance of health span. The second pillar is to balance your blood sugar. So insulin resistance is one of the greatest obstacles to aging. And 
we want to protect our insulin sensitivity at all costs. Sudden spikes in glucose that come with eating higher carb meals and snacks, along with sugary treats and drinks, can accelerate aging. Short term, they make us feel more hungry, have energy dips and tiredness, and can contribute to poor sleep, headaches, and also brain fog. But left unchecked, spikes in blood sugar cause the pancreas to pump out more insulin to help get blood sugar into our cells. Over time, cells stop responding to the insulin, and that's known as insulin resistance. The pancreas keeps making more insulin to try to make cells respond, and eventually the pancreas can't keep up and blood sugar keeps rising. It causes inflammation and a buildup of fat, particularly around the stomach, and can lead to more serious health issues related to insulin resistance, including type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. Cutting back on sugar is the hardest lifestyle change of all for me because I have a really sweet tooth and I often cave into chocolate. So while I work on that, there are some tricks we can deploy to help out, as shared by the brilliant Jessie Inchowski, who I've mentioned before on this channel. She's a biochemist who's carried out a lot of research into how best to manage blood sugar levels. And she wrote a fantastic book called Glucose Revolution that provides an easy guide to changes we can make to balance our blood sugar and reduce the risk from age-related disease. One of the tips, for instance, is to go for a walk or get active. Even 10 minutes helps after eating carbs or sugary meals and snacks, and this in itself will help flatten your sugar spike. She also suggests eating your veggies first to create a viscous mesh in our gut that helps slow the absorption of sugar into our blood and or taking a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, either diluted in water or as part of a salad dressing before your meal or snack to balance your blood sugar. Health pillar number three is of course exercise. Now we all know that exercise is good for us, but a new school of thought goes even further by describing muscle as the organ of longevity. It's led by New York-based Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who in her book Forever Strong explains that loss of muscle mass is one of the greatest contributors to age-related disease. She believes weight training is essential to mitigating these effects. I only joined a gym a few months ago, and I'm no natural gym goer. In fact, the thing that gets me through the door is the sauna. So I spend 30 minutes three times a week in the gym, working out with weights, before hot-footing it downstairs into the sauna. And a bit like the Nera laser, sitting in the sauna releases something called heat shock proteins, which basically support cell repair and renewal. So for me, it's a win-win, and I'll link to my article about the benefits of sauna bathing below. It's a lot of links I'm gonna be adding in this week. I also walk most days for at least 30 minutes. It's what I did first thing this morning in the rain after my rough night's sleep, and that alone brought me back to near normal. And although I'm not gonna be entering any strong woman competitions anytime soon, it is extraordinary to feel strength coming back into weak knees and joints through exercise and to be able to do a push-up again. And I can tell you, there are people of all ages, sizes, and stages of fitness in the gym, so don't be put off going. Even just starting with resistance bands at home will make a difference. The fourth and final pillar is sleep. Now that is ironic after the night I've just had, but it used to be seen as a sign of good strength and stamina to not require much sleep. We think of the early riser heading to the gym at 5 a.m. and pushing right through to midnight, maxing out each day. But the reality is we need a good night's sleep. And for most adults, that's at least seven hours to support the function of body, mind, and skin. And because sleep is when the body has the most opportunity to renew and repair itself, cutting it short gives it less of a chance to do that, and we can't afford to skip the repair shop as we age. So sleep should be a priority, and if you're struggling, and I know what that feels like, it's worth exploring solutions including talking to your doctor about low-dose melatonin supplementation to get you back into a better cycle, or HRT if you're open to that and it's relevant to your situation. It feels like I'll need to make some adjustments to mine. Um, even listening to white noise usually helps me out as well. And those four points, eating naturally, balancing your blood sugar, exercise and sleep are for me 
the true pillars of healthy aging, along with family and companionship, and having a sense of purpose in life too. So sure, I take a few supplements, including NMN at a low dose, as well as vitamin D3 with K2 and a couple of others, but lifestyle is my main focus. A fifth pillar of aging, may emerge over the next few years, and that's our skin. And that's because an increasing number of scientists are flagging that the health of our skin can impact our wider health, including potentially our levels of inflammation and even cognitive function. It's an area I intend to explore more fully on the channel in the coming months and years as further research emerges. But now, it's your turn to let me know your views. Does your skincare and health regimen sound similar to mine, or is there something else you swear by? Do you feel bamboozled by all the conflicting information out there? And do you think it's helpful to keep it to a few core pillars like the four that I've just suggested? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, then by giving it a thumbs up, you help it reach more people. And to watch more content from me, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and head over to my website, honest.scott, where if you scroll down to the bottom of any page, you can sign up to my monthly newsletter. And there's always a great giveaway each month as well. For now, thank you for being here today and I'll see you next time.